It's a little Western. I love it. I think the website I found the royalty free track on, I think that said it was, uh, I think this song is also played on Tiger King. Tiger King? So I don't know what I have to do with Tiger King, but I liked the song. So I was like, if there's a lot of Tiger King fans out there. <laughs> I, was, I was feeling more Sons of Anarchy with it. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. yeah. So I think, uh, yeah, in general. Yeah, just, you know, so either way, Tiger King or Sons of Anarchy, that's the kind of, t- yeah, that, that, that's the, uh, that's kind of crowd emotions remarkable. that we build out. But everyone, uh, we're on episode three of the Hollow Scene podcast here with Eric Fernandez, um, a financial advisor and Flagstaff resident and retired professional runner and father of two, husband and father. Um, do you have any other accolades or titles that I haven't listed out there that you'd like to add in there? There's a lot of accolades and titles <laughs> I use for myself, but my wife disagrees with a lot of them because they're just kind of self-proclaimed at this point. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> Fair enough. All right. Well, Austin, well, it's so excited to have Eric, uh, you on the podcast, Eric. Um, you know, there's there's a lot going on right now, and and a lot of people are. W- would you agree that we are in a? Uh, there is a lot of hyper awareness about markets and finance right now. Absolutely, and I think what's interesting about what's happening right now is that we are in a bear market that's long, the longest we've really seen over the past decade. But if we look at historical measures. Markets are supposed to do this about 25% of the time. It's just that 75% where we get really comfortable, overly optimistic, that can trigger some emotional responses to a perfectly normal event within the markets. Right yeah. Now. And that blows me away. <laughs> you and I talk about that all the time, <laughs> is emotion. What percentage of emotion um, plays into... Yeah, what would you say? And 38% of statistics are made up on the spot. <laughs> so I let's, just made that one up. <laughs> let's make up some more here. As far as in, in your profession and seeing this in play, what percentage of emotion do you think plays into the reality of markets being tough or we're going to lose money or my 401k? You know, there's a reality, mm-hmm. right? That, that, okay, your 401k, if you check it, what is that? Another statistic is like the people that check their, I don't know the percentage, but I do know, you know, I talked about this one, that yeah. the people that check their portfolio more often tend to have a lower rate of return or statistically have a lower rate of return than people that don't. And, and so that emotion of people thinking, hey, I need to do something. Where's that line of people? Hey, you, you know, that's a valid emotion. We need to do something or hey, you need to kind of ignore like your freak out mode we're not in a, yeah. you know, I, I don't know. Is that making sense? No, it, it is making sense. Um, and, and that stat that you shared, actually, it is, it is correct. It's pretty jarring. I've seen the graphs. And when you look at just average long-term market returns and compare it to people that are trying to time the market, move in and out with their comfort levels, they're barely keeping up with inflation at this yeah. point because yeah. they miss out on some of the best market days. We're usually comfortable with the markets when the market's already recovered. So you miss out on all that growth. Uh, But when it comes to emotions, I don't think it's fair to say that someone shouldn't be emotional about their money because this is your nest egg. This is something that you've worked really hard for. And oftentimes when strategizing with that money, there is an emotion behind it. There is a long-term priority that we are targeting. If someone is building up a nest egg for their kids or strategizing to put their kids through college, There's an emotion of love behind that with their kids. So therefore, for emotions to take over when things get rocky, it's at no fault of their own. It's a natural reaction, right? But what I think is uh, critical is that in that 75%, give or take, when markets are, are favorable and they're working to our betterment and on our behalf, that's where you really have to be tactful about how you're strategizing for your priorities. Because when you're having a tactful, strategic conversation about what this money is targeting, you should be preparing it for this 25% downturn because we know it's inevitable. We just don't always know when it's going to happen. So I think what we've noticed this past year is that, yes, people are getting uneasy. Sometimes they need a little bit of coaching or a little bit of reassurance. But when we tie things back to those deeper conversations we had before the markets of 2022 and we realize, hey, we prepared for this type of market, we're still on our benchmark or exceeding it, we're still targeting that priority, then that puts people at ease and candidly buys us patience because that's what we need right now. We need patience. 
And the longer that markets stay turbulent, the longer that markets are giving us some tough gut reactions when we look at our statements, that patience does get weathered a little bit. But if you continue to check back in and uh, check back in on the time frames you're working with your money, uh, check back in on those benchmarks I discussed, and then really start looking at some of the opportunities that have been provided for us in the current market where we can really exceed and see exponential growth for those long-term priorities, that's where it starts to give you a little bit of a mental shift. Okay. And uh, let's maybe talk, well, let, let's start base level first because that's where there's so many different financial pictures mm-hmm. to the Flagstaff household, right? If we're talking to the Flagstaff, Northern Arizona communities, um, there's some people that just think, okay, we're dealing with, uh, yeah, it was kind of funny. I was talking to a good friend of mine, right? And he's like, all of my employees are asking for raises right now. And I'm like, it's, it's a tough situation to be in because the definition of inflation is that the cost of goods is outpacing wages. Right. So I'm like, <laughs> so it's hard, is it like, you know, because he's not, um, he's not bringing more in. Wait, is That's inflation a word this year? I haven't heard people use it this year, <laughs> in 2022. This is news to me. So. We need like a little like sarcasm <laughs> banner with Eric <laughs> these days, but yeah, you know, that's the definition of it. So while his pra- uh, you know, his practice isn't necessarily bringing in like uh, exponentially more money, that his costs and his employees' costs is all going up and outpacing mm-hmm. what they're bringing in. And I mean, that's a tough conversation to have with people and saying like, there's not necessarily more money to go around. Right. Um, there's, I mean, that's exactly what we what we're you know, the Fed and everything is trying to do is just start have less dollars circulating right now to calm that inflation down. And so we have a lot of people out there that saying, because I think so many people are in this boat of like, all right, it sounds great to be investing, right, to these big financial goals. And like, you know, the thoughts of either buying a house, saving for retirement, saving for college funds, for a lot of folks. So let's, let's start on like step one, for a lot of those folks, and we'll go through some additional steps here um, where different people are at, that seems pretty far away, right? right? It seems like, hey, that's a luxury. To, right. Have you ever seen that SNL? How I sent that SNL joke to you where it's like saved money? No, but I'd like to see it. <laughs> oh, yeah. They, they so, do a lot of, about crypto that I enjoy. No, so. this one's an old one. This one's a Mar- uh, Martin Short one, and I'll send it over to you at some point in time. But, the, you know, it just let's talk about like just core budgeting right now. How do we get in a position so we have discretionary money to be able to actually have mid and long-term financial goals versus, Hey, I made the money and I'm paycheck to paycheck. I'm going to go buy the food. That's not inflated cost. Right. And that's all we got right now. How, you know, what are some, do you have some practical thoughts for us on that end? Okay. Yeah. It, and you know what the whole point of inflation too, it, it is interesting what you referenced about. It is a, a real factor in our day-to-day lives right now. Inflation's a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy though. Because of the exact example you gave, the more we talk about it, the more it happens because the more incentivized people feel to go in and say, I need a raise for this corporation or company that might not be making enough money to sustain that raise. So they're going to have to increase their prices, too. Uh, So it's pretty interesting how we see that circle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It has to stop somewhere. But uh, yeah, as far as household budgeting, financing, thinking about the long term versus the needs of today, I mean, you have to look at it like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Right. If you have shelter and food on your table, great. That's step one. Make sure that your family is secure because you don't want to be investing long term and then feel like you can't pay your rent or your mortgage because you're putting all this money into savings. So uh, there are actually there, there's a principle I share um, and it's around the four things that you can do with money. OK, what do you Seriously. think the four things are? What's the goal? What, what, four what, what are the four, four things, things for basic that you can finance. possibly do with money? Okay. Um, it, with the goal of like trying to save it? No, just, just if you have things. money, if there you have are money. four possible okay. things you can do with it, and that's it. You can spend it on needs. You can spend, spend it, it on, in general. You can spend it. Okay, so spend it. Yeah. You can save it. You can invest it. And um, let me see. You can buy real estate with it. <laughs> <laughs> That might be investing. I don't know. Oh, this, this just a, that was a little biased answer. No, it just shows where your altruism is because it's yeah, donate yeah. it. You oh, know, oh, that didn't even cross no. your mind that you could be donating it, giving it. I away. thought that, that was a given. 
a general gifting, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. So so if you look at the so four things. So spend it, save it, invest. Well, donate it. Let's talk about really what we should. <laughs> yeah, donate. okay. You're trying donate. to cover yeah. yourself now. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, okay. okay. So donate, spend it, save it, invest it. Right. So those are those are the four things we can do with money. So if you're I looking like at your your basic needs and wanting to uh, start establishing yourself for the future, you look at the four possible outcomes of the dollars that are in your pocket. There's expenses that you need. So you have to spend on those expenses. Then there's this principle that you always pay yourself first with the surplus. So if all of your needs are met and you have a surplus, instead of going and doing some extra Amazon shopping, maybe 10 or 20% of that should be going into your savings account, build up that emergency fund. With gifting, donating, if you have kids, organizations you care about, if you're someone who tithes, things like that, that that falls in that donation uh, category, and that's going to be much more about your values and what's important to you with your money. But then at the very end, that's when we have investing. And as a financial advisor, I'm obviously a huge fan of people investing. I think it's one of the most efficient vehicles we have for long-term growth, wealth, and achievement of our milestones and priorities but if you look at the four things you can do, look at spending on your needs and saving first. And then from there, you can start to take a little bit of a deeper plunge into the financial pool. And I think where a lot of that is, and, and this is for even though we kind of start on that case, step one, you need to get, you know, just get real with your budget and figure out where you can free up some needs from wants. I think that's a kind of a basic, which we, but, but I'm going to say on that, that that's something where I think it's, um, all categories of financial households right now could hear that, right? right. And uh, I mean, that's, that's again, when we talk about why have we gotten to where we've gotten, because we as Americans are like buying everything. Oh, we're a consumer society. <laughs> that, that's over 60%. Yeah. Over 60% of our economy is the fact that folks like you and me like to swipe our cards. Yeah. That's a huge factor. Yeah. So. And, and that's where even... Uh, um, you know, doing that simple sit down, print off all the statements, find out where your money's going and say, Hey, do we really go to this gym anymore? That's $300 a month. Right. Yeah. You know, like we, we enjoy our luxuries and we have a lot of them, but, but that's where, so if we step into, okay, we're, we're, we're now creating a surplus. We now have some discretionary funds. You talk to Chris, he'll say buy real estate. Talk to Eric, he'll say no. There's well, a marriage. There's a marriage. There's, there's, there's a marriage. We'll talk this. about yeah. the marriage in a second. Yeah. But, but to that person that's saying, hey, I have some funds. This seems like a terrible market, right, to be putting money in. I hear everything's going crazy. And actually, before I forget, did you know? So and I'm, I'm very ignorant on this, too. When we talk about just the volatility of things. So I'm going to use some terms that I don't really understand. So I probably shouldn't use these, but you'd understand them. Don't put me on the spot. Someone was explaining to me, or I was watching this, this uh, interview and they said on a volatility index, Mm -hmm. right? Just that seems pretty straightforward. So I think it's called the VIX. Okay. So on the VIX, that mortgage rates have been more volatile than crypto the last like several months. Really? (laughs) <laughs> which is crazy because everyone would think like more than we're, we're not going to talk about crypto this year, but, but people, yeah, I think generally speaking, people think like crypto is a high risk you know, investment right now. Um, but mortgage rates have been more volatile than crypto the last three, couple months. I hadn't heard that. I just heard about the, what is it? A 20 year high on 30 year rates right now. Um, it is. Yeah, actually right there. Yep. Yeah. So we'll get into strategies on that as well, or could, <laughs> but, but talking more on that. So people are concerned in that category of, Hey, I have, so I've followed some steps. I have some discretionary cash. Is there opportunity in markets like right now? And generally speaking, obviously this is not like financial specific advisement. Call Eric, he'll, he'll find out your goals and walk through it. But what generally speaking, where's opportunity in markets like this? It's a great question. Or should we be waiting? And watching and, and day trading. <laughs> yeah, just, just day trade. You'll be fine. Don't Individual take that stocks, seriously. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I think it's Warren Buffett who had this quote that I love. And he said, uh, the stock market is the only marketplace you can find where when everything goes on discount, people run for the exits. Right? Because if you think yeah, about yeah. it, we, we have a Lululemon here in town. Okay. My wife loves Lululemon. And I like it too because she buys me really comfortable shirts from there. But I love nothing more. I'm not going to judge you for that. They're comfortable. I don't care. And the sweatpants. Um, not a plug. But <laughs> okay. 
I, I love nothing more than when she comes home and she says, hey, Eric, I went to Lululemon. I found this shirt for you 30% off. Yeah. Because I'm getting that same quality of shirt at a 30% discount. Yeah. And if you think about the market being anywhere from 20 to 30% down, we are buying the same quality investment at a huge discount. So it always you always have to circle back to what are the needs, what are the principles behind this money? Because if someone came to me and said, hey, Eric, I want to invest X amount of dollars. It's for something that I'm planning in three months. So I'll need that money available in three months. I'd yeah. say, great, keep it in cash because you don't want to yeah. be exposed to that market risk. Sure. But when you're looking at that long-term picture, money that you don't need today and don't forecast needing in the near future, there are, there are a number of opportunities in the market right now. Uh, I've been telling clients left and right, 2022 has been an Eric Fernandez heyday as far as money that I'm just shoveling into the market because some of my favorite investments are on a deep, deep discount. And a lot of what we do is look at historical averages. So if you look at a historical average, the first one I look at is that the average market recovery from a bear market like we're in right now, when it expands again, is 168%. 168% return. Not guaranteeing that happens in the future, but that's what the historical average has been. If you also look at it where the market was at the beginning of this year before effectively January 3rd when it started to slide, for the market to get back to where it started this year at, if it took it three years to do that from the lows of September, if it took it three years to get back to where it was at the beginning of this year, that's an average return of over 12% per year. So if you have new dollars that you're putting in the market, you're exponentially creating higher returns for yourself right now. But again, you can't do it without having an appropriate risk conversation and also looking at what these dollars are targeting because you have to be prepared in a shortened time frame that the, these guarantees are not, or these returns are not guaranteed. Nothing that I just said is guaranteed, but it's just historically what happens on a regular basis. Um, market has never failed us coming out of a bear market like we're in right now, it has never failed us to match its priors high and then supersede it on the following expansion. So it's exciting. So, so attitude and, and big picture mindset, you know, as, as you're talking there, I was thinking of, uh, so you and I were having good jokes on like the spend yeah. and, uh, and where, you know, I love children and my children and, uh, but they can get. I'm. I'm getting in that mode where they're getting expensive. Like, My we kids thought are expensive diapers. And they're much younger than you. Yeah, we <laughs> thought we thought diapers were expensive, and then uh, my nine year old daughter Charlie is uh, is now into horses, and horses are life, right? She's uh, she's gonna at some point she's she says she's gonna take over these mics and do uh, the, the horse nerd podcast. So <laughs> that's been uh, that's yeah. So she's she's all in it, but when she's. Uh, so she, you know, and I've uh, and going to some of her lessons, and I, you know, I'm learning some life lessons in this. And there was there was this. Uh, I was there two weeks ago, and she's just she's not jumping the horse, but they just start to uh, walk over things, right? So mm-hmm. she's needing to steer it, go a certain pace, and needing to guide it so it walks over like two logs five feet apart, right? And what happens is that the and you're looking at me like, where are we going, Chris? <laughs> but, That's half my conversations with you. Where are we going, Chris? Take, so, take so what's interesting, though, back. is that, you know, for a new rider, um, they keep telling her, look up, look up, look up, right? And they say, the, the horse does everything. You can only do two things with the horse. You can tell it where to go and how fast to get there. That's mm-hmm. all you can do. The horse does everything else. And so when she was cr- crossing over these logs and she gets nervous of like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking down at the logs, right? It's not unlike you and me on a hiking trail where if you're, like, you're trying to just look at exactly where your feet are and move them over the rock, that's going to be very clunky. Right. And the horse actually see, you know, feels her body position and stops. If, if the horse feels her looking down, yes. the horse stops? Yes, the horse stops. Okay. Whereas if she looks up where she wants to go, the horse is looking at those logs. We'll manage that and we'll go forward where she wants to go so before she can get into like jumping an obstacle she needs to say hey i'm gonna look past the obstacle where i want to go right a lot of life lesson in that right Mm -hmm. and so it's just it's very interesting to me when i think about real estate right now when i think about um financial markets that so many people are looking down so worried about this obstacle in front of them like what are we gonna do like there's price reductions on real estate and there's like you said walking away from discount but people are just so nervous seeing this obstacle not realizing 
I think there's so much value in when you're talking about where you want to go than just saying, hey, I'm managing, right? We're managing here. So it's big picture thought, right? If you need that money now or within a certain finite period of time, soon, you know, a, a shorter period of time, that we're going to want to just keep that in cash, keep that saved. Right, right. But if that money is not working for you right now and you don't need it, that you got to see where you're going. And that changes that path and trajectory, right? right? But I guess what would you say to people as far as maybe more in that, so I'm kind of jumping back to what amount though, when they're starting to get some savings and some ability, and even with folks that have a level of some investments now, I mean, what moves even matter? Like how much money would I need to really have to where it would matter to start investing? It's. A, I mean, that's a great question. I think any dollar matters, right? I mean, the idea with the market long term is you want to have compounded returns. If you get a 15% return on $100,000, you made $15,000. You get that same 15% return on $100, you made $15. But is uh, there's a, a story, you probably have heard about it, about um, if you start with a penny and you double it every day. So the next day you have two pennies, third day you have four pennies. Did you and I talk about this? I've it, been telling so many people about this recently. Well, it's interesting, right? <laughs> because like you're halfway through the month and maybe you have like 10 bucks to your name. But then you get to the end of a month of just doubling that money, and what is it like thirty million dollars or something? No, so in thirty days, it's five point three million. Oh, five point. I overshot a little bit. So one penny. So it's <laughs> <laughs> gonna make jokes, and Eric tends to do this. Just kidding. I, I overpromise. I overpromise. Oh, shoot. <laughs> um, but no. But that's that's the. In, I mean, that's the that's the magic of compounding interest, right? Right. And I think that that's it says if you don't start, you don't get there, right? If you don't start somewhere. Um, and you can start with kids. Um, one of the greatest gifts that my mom gave me, and this might be why I'm in this industry is, uh, I was like, shoot, I was probably nine years old or something. And I entered this competition to have a drawing on the front of this magazine. And somehow I won because the drawing was not good. So I think they were going for like, Hey, look, a little kid drew this and it didn't come out good, but it had something to do with the story in the magazine. I have no clue. All I know is I got a $300 check when I was like nine years old and I was stoked. I was thinking about all the Hot Wheels cars I was going to buy, <laughs> new Lincoln logs, right? And my mom took that money and she put it into a mutual fund and she put it into a mutual fund in my name. And um, from that point forward, when, as I was getting older, if I did chores around the house, got an allowance, whatever it was, she would make me take 20% of my allowance. So I got a $5 allowance. Here's $1. You're going to save it. Right. So you start you start with kids young to really learn those principles. But even as an adult who hasn't started saving yet, every dollar counts. The earlier you can start, the better. But no matter what that amount is that you're putting in, that will eventually have that compounding principle that we talked about that can give you exponential growth and wealth. And do you find in your consulting with people as you're talking about that? One thing that comes to my mind is that a lot of people so if you go from that first step of like, all right, you understand it's important to save money. That's that. And that's what else gets so hilarious. And it's like, how do we get this thing called saved money? Um, so if you, if you cross that bridge that you've started to save some money and then you, you know, then the next bridge of saying, Hey, you know, I'm not going to use this money for any immediate goals. What could I be doing that? So that's doing with it. So it's working for me. I, th I think what happens though, would you say that this happens where a lot of people kind of get to that point, right? That they're, they're, they're not just surviving, they're having some growth and success in their life and they're putting money away and they're maybe even investing, you know, passively investing, getting a little bit there. How many people, you know, with fake, fake statistics that we're doing here, I'm curious on how many people you feel actually have a driven goal for every dollar, or that they're just generally, once they've gotten to that point, that they're just generally saying, hey, I should be putting this money away and doing, you know, doing more with it than I am, but I yeah. don't really have a goal for where I want that money to go. I think we all have goals. Um, so that was one profound. Should I quote that? What? <laughs> <laughs> well, you think that was profound. I'm about to hit you with a, with a side bolt, right? <laughs> okay, sorry. Go ahead. So one thing that I've proactively done this year is I've replaced the word goals with priorities. And the reason why 
is because if I go to you and I say, hey, Chris, what's your goal? I don't know. Sure. What's your priority? Getting your daughter the horse, getting your kids through college, That's right? That's her priority. That's right her now. priority. You're, <laughs> which has become some of my priorities. <laughs> Charlie, sorry, not high on the list, but we'll get there. We'll get there, daughter. But, but no... <laughs> I mean, yeah, my kids' priorities, that's a three-year-old and a one-and-a-half-year-old. There's very interesting priorities there. They just want to become the next Monstars. But, um, <laughs> Space Jam reference. Right, Space Jam. My son loves Space Jam. <laughs> so, no, but the point there is I really thought about that. If someone said, Eric, what's your goal? I'd say, I don't know, play basketball with LeBron James. That would be pretty cool. Yeah. But if someone said, what's your priority? It's to create financial freedom for my family. It's to go on trips with my wife. It's to make sure that my kids grow up never hungry, things like that. Um, so when talking about people with driven goals, we all have driven goals. It's oftentimes structured in these priorities that they have for themselves and their loved ones. I think the hard part is when it comes to what's driving that, when they're allocating dollars towards that, that's where we have to look at our own behaviors. Because I know that if I have discretionary money in my bank account, I'm probably going to buy an autographed baseball or a sports jersey I don't need, or call my wife and say, hey, we're going on a, a long weekend vacation somewhere. And I want that freedom to be able to do that when I see discretionary money in my bank account, but that's why we've automated and systemized the things that we're saving for for those bigger priorities. I have money automatically being deducted to go to my kids' college funds, automatically deducted to go to our retirement accounts, automatic, automatically deducted to go to a separate savings account, right? So I, th I think... Uh, to circle back and with your question about driven goals and make my point some here, somewhere here in the chaos of my rambling, uh, we all have them. It's just if we've systemized them or looked at ourselves and recognized, do we have the discipline to do this on our own without having it systemized? Yeah. I'm curious. I'm going to put you on the spot on this one. Oh, good. Just a fun, a fun question here. Is, is you're able to share, is there a goal that someone told, or a priority. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that, actually. Um, and uh, because that really gets down to the day-to-day. -day, mm -hmm. right? I think we all have daily priorities. And even though we should have, like, daily goals, we all know that. That, uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's hard to say, like, did I, did I accomplish my goals today? Right, right. <laughs> right? Especially. <laughs> yeah. Goals but, are so, never ending, right? You're, no, no. And, and we see those, like, a lot of times, I think, as larger things. And we all know, hey, to accomplish, you know, to eat an elephant, you gotta bite it one or what, one bite at a time. When are you eating elephants? It's it's a saying. Okay. <laughs> I prefer steak, but you know that comes from a cow. So. But but if we are so so to go into that though is is there so so my fun question is there a priority or a goal that someone shared with you that cut you off guard because you hear probably a lot of similar like hey I have a retirement date hey I have a um, I want to buy real estate or I want to. Um, go on a vacation or get my kids to college. So there's probably a lot that you hear on repeat. But is there is there one that stands out, like someone shared a certain financial goal or, or something that you thought, like, hey, this person dreams big. Or, this is awesome. <laughs> or, this is out of the box. Uh, well, there is one. It's actually from a, a colleague of mine versus a client. Okay, okay. But he told me that his priority in life is to have a private plane. He, he's trying to build this, this wealth and this nest egg for himself where at one point he's going to have a private plane. And I thought to myself, sweet, I don't want to own a plane, but I want to know someone who owns a plane because then I can mooch off of that plane, you know? So it, is this individual going to fly the plane or are they going to have a pilot? I don't know if he's thought it through. I think there's just this lore of owning his own plane. <laughs> but he's a good buddy of mine, so I, love it. I, I was like, I'm going to stay in good with you because I want rides on that plane. Yeah, yeah so. oh, that's, that's a dream big picture for sure. Yeah. That's fun though, but that, and I think that's this key part is if you don't think about, like if if you don't think about how you'll get there, you never will, right? And, and so so and, and I know some of these topics for a lot of people might be like, oh, it's one on one, but I'm curious to say, okay, what do you have any other thoughts or advice for people in saying, hey, how can you, like, because I think we are our worst enemies on a lot of these things. Because mm -hmm. if we, I know like, I'm my own worst enemy. We're right. we're busy, yeah. right? And we're 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 training our brains mm -hmm. to just these dopamine hits and watching things <laughs> and like, and then even in work sense, it's like to the next email, to the next phone call. And we have a really hard time, I think generally lifting our heads up, going to my personality, right? And, and, and lifting our heads up and seeing where am I actually going? And am I taking the steps or am I just tripping in my own life? Cause I don't have like, um, 
book. I started reading. I started, oh, I'm listening to books. I'm illiterate. Um, <laughs> so it's called The Second Mountain, right? Yeah. And it talks about, you know, that, that second mountain being that, uh, you know, past just the, hey, I need to survive. I need to, mm-hmm. you know, I want the house, the job, the whatever. It's really that, that growth and that significance and that joy, not just happiness, right? And so I think that we get so busy in our lives that we get so stuck on that first mountain of, oh, I just got to, you know, make, pay the bills, you know, try and get on a vacation every now and then, right? right? Versus actually looking up and saying, where do I really want to go? And and how do I get there? And so what are some, for, for people that are starting to think bigger, right? And starting to think like, hey, like even, even some initial bigger thoughts could be like, hey, I want to own a house or hey i want to get the kids to college those are some more you know common priorities that some people and i love that word priorities that people Mm -hmm. can have in life what are some of the small steps that help people get there like what are the daily weekly monthly disciplines that people need to be outside of like budgeting how do they start getting there by using markets and investment to get there great question um and you know this isn't this isn't even a, a plug for you or me. It's just my personal beliefs and having professional advice, right? Because I, I think if you don't know the path that you're supposed to go on to achieve these priorities, that's where you look locally for your resources to help you create that path. Uh, I remember when my wife and I were getting married and we said we want to be able to buy a house when we get married. I had no clue the first step in doing that. So who did I talk to? I talked to Chris Hollows, your local Wallach and Volk lender, right? And that was how our friendship even started, was in that sure. initial meeting. Are we friends? Uh, I can, I, I have, so I'm, like a, I'm like a tick. I just kind of hold on to people. Yeah, no, no, them, no, but, no, I love it. Um, and and I, I think the same thing might be appropriate for other folks because there is a world of opportunity, investments, and solutions out there. And if you're coming in blind and just thinking to yourself, I have a priority I want to achieve, but I don't know where to start, you're going to get hung up in all the information, all the options, and you might find a solution that works but isn't necessarily in your best interest. Yeah. So I, that's kind of my way of not answering the question because without knowing – who this hypothetical individual is that you're talking about that wants to start these priorities, I don't know what would be right for them, right? I don't know if by saving for college, they're thinking that their kid's going to go to NAU and get in-state tuition or if they're going to go to Harvard. I don't know what their tax situation looks like if we need to be creating a tax-free solution for this college or if we want broader flexibility. I don't know what the time frame looks like. How much risk can we take? Should we be looking at just interest-bearing options? Um, I mean, and that's, I think that's the, the scary part for people sometimes when they get started, because with anything, there's just a wealth of information out there, and you don't know where to start. There's a wealth of options out there. You don't know what's in your best interest. But having some form of guidance usually uh, can at least create conviction in what you're doing, and I think that's the, the kicker, right? If we circle back to the very first topic we talked about, people having emotions in markets like this. If you go into a market like this and you don't have conviction about your strategy going into it, there is no way you're going to have conviction in your strategy going through it. Yeah. And if you're not educated on that strategy and why you should have conviction about it, then you're going to be behind the eight ball when you're trying to educate yourself on it while you're feeling emotional, right? Yeah. There's, um, there's actually two books that I read. I didn't listen to. I actually read them because, <laughs> you know, I'm better than you. Um <laughs> But there, there's there's okay, two books it. that I love. The first one, it's called Mindset. It's by Carol Dweck. She's uh, have you have you heard of this book? No. She's a, I think I believe she's a psychologist, but she talks about the difference between a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. And we're born with both of them. We have okay. both of them, and there's no fault in the fact that in our day to day we'll shift between the two. But a, a fixed mindset is very constraining, and you can look at it in your home life, how you're dealing with your kids or your spouse, conversations you're having. You can look at it in business and you can look at it in the decisions that you're making. A fixed mindset is stuck in the now and scared to take that step for progress. A growth mindset actually addresses where you're at right now, looks at the steps you want to make for progress and embraces them. 
seeks help from others, seeks guidance, right? You never want to work with someone who believes they're always right and won't lean on you for your opinions as well. And I think it's okay when we're making our own financial decisions to lean on the opinions of others that we trust. And that might be our parents, that might be our brother, sister, whoever, but uh, that really does help bring us back to that point of conviction when we have uh, just this repertoire of people that we can lean on as our advocates and our rock and making our financial decisions and coaching ourselves through our behavior. So, and that, as you've been saying that, and this is, uh, these are some thoughts I've especially been having recently that we, you know, I think sometimes we do this without intentionality, but in, but really thinking intentionally, I think that everyone, everyone hearing this, all, <laughs> All the all, mass, fans, all the out mass fans out there of our new budding podcast, everyone out there needs two things. They need a board of advisors and they need a tribe. Mm -hmm. Have we talked about this before? No, I don't think we have. Okay. You must talk to my mom then because I've talked to her about this before. <laughs> so I'm curious. <laughs> and those are two different things though, yeah. right? And, and I'm blown a bit away by how many people like, there's nothing more than I love. And in the sense of I have... Yes, I am a mortgage advisor. I am, my, my living is based off of doing mortgages. So I speak highly of them and I love real estate, right? But, but there's nothing.